I'm Henry Seibe. I'm the deputy leader and, and chief strategist of the Landless People's Movement of Namibia. Uh, we have basically started this movement in 2016, December, when one of my friend and a key uh, deputy minister at that time of land reform in Namibia was fired because we have a land reform problem in this country. Uh, you all recall that Namibia was colonized first by the Germany, Imperial German, and then from 1948 onwards, the apartheid South Africa took over until we got independence in 1990. So in 1904 to 1908 period, that period, there was a genocide committed in Namibia against the Ovaharo people and the Nama people the extermination order to exterminate these people were given by uh, one of the army generals of Germany that time, Lothar van Trotter. So, and that genocide subsequently, uh, it was all about the land dispossession. So the local communities of the Damaran, the San, uh, the Namahero, they were resisting Germans taking their farms. Why? Because the farms were fertile. Uh, the land was fertile. Some of the land had mineral resources like diamonds, copper, and etc. Uh, and, and more importantly, the grazing land. So now they resisted. But came independence in 1990, over a long period, presided by SWAPO, Southwest Africa People's Organization. When they took over in 1990, people were now hopeful that these land policies will be amended and that the greater majority of the landless Namibians that lost their ancestral land during the occupation by the Germans and the apartheid South Africa will get their land now back. And that did not happen. So since 1990, you can count when we started the movement in 2016, the indigenous people that lost land now were unhappy. Unhappy in the sense that the new government is following the trajectory that was used by the apartheid South Africa and the Germans to this uh, uh, land grabbing in, improved. And the people that did not lose land when the government buys new farms were settled there. So after 26 years, we decided through Bernardo Swarboy, who is our party leader now, he was in parliament that time, or from the ruling party benches, he spoke out. And the government that time, or the ruling party that he belonged to Swarboy, did not want him to speak out against the land reform, agrarian reform, and all accompanying things of the landlessness, the uh, access to urban land became a crisis uh, uh, and, and so on. So the, uh, whereas the elite now, the ruling elite kept on amassing wealth uh, for themselves. So with all this coming together, we then decided uh, to speak out. So he was kicked out first as a deputy minister of land reform, he was recalled by the president, Hage Gengo. And when he did not stop, he continued to talk about these matters. Then finally, the ruling party recalled him from parliament, the National Assembly. And as a result of that now, uh, the communities, the affected communities came together and said, no, we are supporting you. Let's have an alternative. So that's why we started as a social movement, more like the Occupy War and, and all that. So from 2017, 2018, 2019, after three years, the, the local community said, no, 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 we can continue to exist as a pressure group only. You then need to transform yourselves so that you have a political mandate and to 
raised these issues in the National Assembly of the Parliament. Hence, we registered as a political party in uh, 2019, February. And that same year, elections took place and we won four seats out of uh, 92 and uh, 96. So that's how we are. So currently, we are the second biggest political party in the country. Why? Because we have 14 administrative re regions or political regions, or you will call them provinces. Like in US, there are states. So we have regions here, 14. And our party is governing two of those two regions. Now, the good thing of those two regions is that one, Kara's region, is having all the mineral resources, almost. Diamonds, the new oil and gas finds are there, including the green hydrogen project that is going to take place in Namibia, is from that region. So we, we, we control that. And as a result of that, we have got a greater voice. And the second house, um, up at the lower house national council, we also have six seats there. But our party is the one that is mainly talking for ancestral land rights, uh, genocide reparations, because ours was the first genocide that took place in the world, um, committed by the Imperial Germans. So the, the genocide reparations, including now access to urban land, uh, food production, uh, the whole question of the agrarian um, reform is what we are interested in. So, so that is what we are fighting for. And that is the essence of our movement called the Landless People's Movement. And we are led by the young people, mainly our leader. Of course, in, in the American context, he will be referred very old. He's 45, I'm 44. But most of our leaders are 25, 26, 27 there. And, 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 and that is the, what draws the people also to our movement that that's that's a key yeah yeah that, that's excellent to hear and i want to start by asking a little bit more about the legacy of colonialism in namibia and the legacy of the unequal distribution of land so when swapo came to power in the 1990s did it act on its promises during the during the war for independence against the apartheid regime and expropriate land? Did it deal with the question of the white farmers that were in Namibia? Or as you're saying, it kicked this problem down the, the road. It, it followed the willing buyer, willing seller principle. What would be the strategy to make a more fair land distribution, um, including mm -hmm. in some cases, the expropriation of, of these farms? No, no, it's a fair question. Look down, Namibia is uh, 33 years old. Uh, and, and, and one of the things, as always happens in democracy, is that the first 10, 15, 20 years, although people still feel the pains and what, they will say, okay, let's not radicalize ourselves now because we are hoping for better days to come. Let's give the government time. But what we have witnessed is that the elite, the ruling class, actually became the first ones that started with land grabbing elite capture uh, of, of, of the land deals that took place. Not only that, if you look at our fishing sector, for example, we have a case called a fish rod, where millions and billions of Namibian dollars were siphoned off with some of the Irish companies and so on. That case is going on. When you look at our diamond sector, it is much like a mafia industry. Namibia is highly endowed with mineral resources. Not only that, in terms of our tourism and wildlife concession policies, we are well endowed. But what is happening is that as the country was moving on, the elite began to share these resources amongst themselves, and it did not trickle down as we all want to. Hence, we are suffering until today with the triple challenges of poverty, inequality, and unemployment. Unemployment is very high, about 50s. Uh, they say huge uh, inequality, especially if you look at inequality of urban and rural Namibia, more so urban women and rural women. The gap is, it, it keeps on widening. 
and, and poverty levels, despite all these natural resources, it keeps on rising. Hence today, especially after the COVID pandemic, the youth are unable to find jobs. Namibia is a population of 2.5 million people. Now, a country like United Arab Emirates has got 2 million, more or less uh, uh, 2.3 million people. Two, two point, uh, but the rest, 11 million people are immigrants from elsewhere that are working in United Arab Emirates. But here, we can't solve basic questions of access to water, food, malnutrition, all these things is as a result of malpractice, high corruption, in fact, grand corruption, not even systemic corruption. So we are suffering from all these ills. Hence, people are frustrated. And then, therefore, movements like the landless movements have taken up and to fill uh, that vacuum. So uh, the colonial land dispossession in a new era still continues. Why? Because the communities of the Ovahero, Nama, Damaran, and San, who lost huge hectares of land when it comes to resettlement, are not prioritized. So we, you have, like, uh, Namibia is cut in half. There is the half that never experienced colonial land disposition. And there is this half now, from Venduk downwards, that has experienced colonial land disposition. And these ones that have experienced colonial land disposition are not looked after by the ruling Swapo. Because most of the ruling Swapo leaders never experienced colonial land disruptions. So this adds up to the anger, not only as the traditional communities, the, the indigenous communities, the traditional authorities, the chiefs, the tribal chiefs and so on, they are talking about these issues, but some of them are being co-opted. They are given fishing quarters. They are given uh, uh, shares in some of the uh, businesses and so on, and then they keep quiet. But we said, we are not going to sell our people short. We are going to speak on behalf of the voiceless, the homeless, the landless, the unperfumed and unwashed. We are going to talk on their behalf. And hence, we have taken on, on, on this struggle. So it might not be solved in two, three, four years, but the government should, and we assume, must have concerted policies that are geared towards it. We are now only going to have a proper land bill that is going to come uh, sometime later this year. We, we, we are lacking most of the laws, of course the countries, are, but in most of the areas. So, and that is where the gap is. So the ruling party did not satisfy on the land question. Hence, there are a lot of pressure groups that are talking about the land question until today in Namibia. You will see the former presidents have three, four, five commercial, uh, farms they have farms in the communal land. They have farms in the commercial uh, uh, land areas. Mm -hmm. And because they are co-opted, they keep quiet. And then that's where the problem is. So the land expropriation is a serious issue in this country. The same in South Africa, expropriation of land without compensation. But if you come to uh, look at our case, the majority of people are still landless. They, they are homeless, uh, despite all this mineral wealth. It's not like Namibia is a poor country, no. In terms of the blue economy, in terms of the green economy, we are well resourced. It's how you manage, and corruption is too high. Hmm. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And I think, as you've been discussing, it's, it's very shaming to see what SWAPO has transformed into uh, since it played a role in the liberation struggle and now to this day. Can you discuss a little bit more about when SWAPO took this turn towards a more corrupt uh, neo-colonial presence? Mm. I think I think the ruling party, uh, in you see Namibia when 1990 when we got independent. Uh, and this is what uh, Franz Fanon warned us in the national consciousness, the pitfalls of the national consciousness, the first 10, 15 years was good 10 years. Because remember, we were that time the last colony in Africa. So we ought to have learned 
from post-colonial Africa struggles and problems. But after 10 years, we started to degenerate. Uh, the ruling elite that time started to be obsessed with accumulation of capital. Uh, the, and of course, the commanding heights of the economy, the capital, monopoly capital, the industries, the banking sector, they co-opt, made them boards of companies, give them shares and, and shareholders. So the whole national bourgeoisie was captured now by the corporate capital. And that is where I think they started to forget about the promises that they have made in 1990 in, turn, uh, uh, in replacing those ones with some of the neoliberal economic policies that we are witnessing today. And the other factors, the external factors also played a role. The ruling party began to accept huge sums of, of donations, gifts from the Chinese, Chinese party, uh, the Communist Party of China. They begin to, to accept any Asian businessman, corrupt and illegal. Even now, I just tabled a motion on illegal uh, lithium mining by some of the Chinese companies in Namibia. So these things are happening at the watch of the so-called uh, government ministers. And this is the problem that we are faced with. Capital began to take over, and then they forgot about the socialist or social democratic agenda that we had. We were supposed to start with the welfare economics, yeah? uh, build more hospitals, schools, clinics, especially improving access to education. Because education, if you look at the Simon Kerr's curve, um, in the beginning, inequality widens. But as you educate many people, you, you take people from poor communities, you break down the cycle of poverty that people are living in. Then you are going to move towards an egalitarian society. That did not happen. So the poor families will keep on remaining in poverty. Therefore, there will be a cycle of poverty continuing. And that is what the ruling government did. <clears throat> Some laws were good, but in most of the areas, corruption, capital took over and then they forgot what they were elected to do. And, and, and it's facing all the former liberation movements in Africa. If you look at ANC, the African National Congress of uh, Mandela, how it is today. If you look in Mozambique, Frelimo, if you look at Angola, M MPLA, if you look in Zimbabwe, ZANU-PF, don't even talk about it. Uh, it has become waste. And that is the tragedy of the African leadership. Uh, Moleti Mbeki, South African academic, call it an architect of poverty. It's the, our own leaders. We are 60% of the African land mass. It's rich. We can feed the whole continent. But where does our wheat and our grain come from? Ukraine, Russia. But how much fertile land have we have? In Africa. The same in Namibia. We have got Nekardal Dam, the biggest, one of the biggest dams in Southern Africa. We don't even plant wheat. Don't even mention, uh, you know, rice and other things because of the climatic conditions. But this is the tragedy that we live with. And, and how do we tackle our national budget? How, 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 how do we disperse it uh, to address some of these things? And, and unfortunately, um, that is a tragedy that we are facing. Because what, what we are saying is that, look, if we start with agrarian reform, if you look at all the countries in the world, let's say Britain, even US, we use agriculture as a point of industrialization. So it's a transit to capitalism. And unfortunately, we have failed to do that. Uh, we failed to resolve or solve the classical agrarian question of capital, the classical agrarian question of labor. And, and, and we haven't planned around it. Hence, we are struggling today uh, as 2.5 million people. It's, it's, that's nothing. Looking at the resources that we have, we are facing electricity generation. For example, we don't produce our own energy. 
we import 70% from Zambia, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. South Africa has energy problems. What will happen to us in the next two, three years? Huh? The same way food security. We are not food secure. How long are we going to survive uh, if we close the borders with other countries? Will Namibia feed itself even for two, three months? I doubt so, looking at the current rate. So these are the perennial problems that we are faced with. And I think we are filling that gap. The role that we play in parliament, we bring uh, motions and debates that are really problem solving. Uh, and, 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 and so that because if you also look at the African leadership, Emmanuel Macron in France is 45. He is the same age of my leader, 45, and I'm 44. But in Africa, we are referred as a youth by the ruling parties. Imagine. But the same African leader, our president is maybe 86 years old. Now, when he is here in Africa, Namibia, Bendu, he will refer to us as youth. But the same president will travel to Paris and meet Emmanuel Macron, who is 45 our age, and call him, bow down. Oh, our leader, we admire your policy. Oh, you are a responsible leader. But he undermines. Do you know France, Emmanuel Macron? Can any, he, he, that's a nuclear power also. But here, the same age will be told irresponsible. No, you can trust them with governance and leadership issues. But our generation should be the ones to spare head. We can't be led by somebody who is 86, uh, 80 years old, 71, 75. Donald Trump tried it in US and look how it ended. We don't want that. Bo o o Obama, Barack, when he took over office, he was around 44 or so. When he left, he was 55. How old was he? And you see, and that's what we want. We want similar, if you look at the former Australian Prime Minister, Yacinda Arden, she was our age. If you look at that guy, Canada, Tradu, of course that one is a bit older, but it's within the same range. If you look at the Prime Minister of England or, or, or UK, so it is the era, uh, Austria, it is the time that our generation must be at the forefront because we are at the cutting edge. We have learned we are not in the liberation struggle days. Now it's for economic struggle. And we are unable to do that due to our policies. Most of the time and high level corruption. Those are our downfalls. Right. And especially to see the legacy of SWAPO becoming, like you're mentioning, all these other liberation movements. I, I want to focus a little bit on the immediate legacy as well. So you discussed a little bit about German colonialism. Maybe we can start there in your your party's program, what you've been agitating for. Germany did announce that they would pay some small reparation, I think close to a billion. Uh, but the response from uh, from Namibians was, this is not reparations. There needs to be a more structural solution uh, to the legacy of German colonialism and the genocide as well. Do you think that an apology and a small sum of money will just wipe their hands clean? Or do you demand that there's a more all-encompassing reparation that Germany and other European countries should pay across Africa? Yeah, I think um, you are referring to the genocide reparations quantum. Uh, we discussed it last year, uh, and, and the pre last year especially in in Parliament. Um, in fact, and then there was no agreement. We said the, the what Germany was offering to the lives lost, to the livestock, to the infrastructure, uh, cannot be replaced anyway by any amount of money. But we said what they are offering was too low, too small, the quantum uh, that they were offering. And then as a result of that, the opposition parties, but ruling party was agreeing. They agreed because uh, they, they will get that money so that they can apparently claim that, that it's them who brought development to, to, to the affected areas. But we rejected it. It was withdrawn from parliament, I think last year around 1st or 2nd of December. Um, now our party, has taken the Namibian government 
the president, the foreign affairs minister, all of them to court. I think it's on the roll, high court roll. Um, I think around June or so, this case might be heard uh, in, in our courts. And we are going to see what the final outcomes will be. But nonetheless, the quantum is not good. Namibian government has further divided the, the affected communities of Ovahero, Nama, Damara, and San. Because there are those traditional leaders that belong to the ruling party. And some who are neutral, and some who belong to other political parties due to this or other. But the government only chose to work with their puppet, puppet uh, leaders. So the communities, what the government did, the Swabo did, was they further divide the communities further down the lines. And there is this great polarization. But despite that, um, we are waiting for on the outcomes of the high court in this country to see how they have pronounced themselves. But we we agree, we we, we, we basically reject the, uh, what you call the, uh, what Germany has put on table. They have apologized. They sent the economic development minister some years back to Namibia, to Ventu, to apologize. But we would have loved to have an apology from the president and the chancellor uh, themselves from Germany. In Germany, they are refusing to raise these things in Bundestag. They don't want to discuss it there. But we have friends there, Dilinge. Dilinge is a party that is there. Although they are in a minority, they are uh, working with us. And we have got some foundations like the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. They are very progressive in Germany. They are helping with us with this cause, either by way of research, solidarity, support, and otherwise. But that case will continue. It must be solved um, uh, within our lifetime so that we can say the affected communities, they must decide what they want to do, whether they want to build schools, clinics, roads, uh, have community trust funds, or even monthly payments for themselves, like pension grants, it's fine. They must decide for themselves what they want to do. Not the Namibian government, and also not the Federal Republic of German government, no. And, and on the broader question of, of reparations, I mean, when we see these Europeans who come like Macron or, or for example, the Belgians, you know, returning Lumumba's tooth, isn't offensive to see Europeans believe that they can just sort of wash their hands of these problems without a, a structural redistribution of, as you, as you mentioned, Fanon saying that the wealth of Africa built all of Europe uh, and that there has to be, as you're saying, a deep investment within the countries that have been destroyed by colonialism, rather than just these apologies, you know, sending mm -hmm. statues back or whatever mm -hmm. ceremonial things. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, most of the European governments, what they did was they set up uh, diplomatic missions in different African countries, and then they help in terms of development assistance. Uh, but that development assistance sometimes comes with very strict and stringent conditions. There are some conditionalities attached, let's say, to concessional loans and all those things. You know what, like France did in West Africa is terrible. I think France was the worst colonialist uh, that, uh, that you could get. Uh, they are even charging until today. If a project exceeds a certain billion uh, French francs, the, the, it must be decided in Paris. Hence, they have removed Laurent Gbagbo in Cote d'Ivoire, who was saying, no, they are still paying the colonial tax in, in uh, Francophone countries. Everything gets decided in France. And once you disagree with them, they send troops to remove you. And, and look, uh, that's why countries like uh, uh, Cote d'Ivoire and others are unable to, to move beyond what is being said. So neocolonialism uh, is, is actually the highest stage of imperialism. It's taking place right here in Africa, like Kwame Nkrumah rightly said. So that continues in Namibia. 
we have neocolonialists here to this. So neocolonialism will never end. It, it is here. It has been uh, uh, promoted even through globalization, uh, neoliberalism, neo uh, economic policies is what is destroying also the African countries. If you look at the world systems theory written by Emmanuel Wallerstein, the core periphery and non-periphery countries, that, that, that debate, how the countries of the, of the periphery, their resources are being exploited, exported in raw form, countries of the core, then they produce products there and send it back to us on an expensive. Our diamond industry, the same. So that is the typical challenge that we are faced with. But these things, we need to have international dialogues more and to address this. So neocolonialism is now continuing. And as Africans, as, as, as the countries of the global South, we must have concerted agenda. Look at the climate change and how they are dealing with it. So these are the areas that we must work together. Asia, Pacific, Caribbean countries, and see how we can at least take some leverage and use it here at home for our own benefit. And especially you mentioned the Caribbean countries too, and it, it's very incredible to see the this global reparations movement that is emerging uh, throughout Africa and the Caribbean in particular uh, against the legacy of slavery for the development, uh, against underdevelopment and peripheralization, as you mentioned. So do, do you see Namibia as one of these leading examples of where the fight for reparations is, is happening right now in the world? Yeah, it, it, it can happen. It's only that our government is anti-progressive. They are useless on that front. But if you look at landless people's movement and the others, it's happening. In fact, I, I, we, we support what a Brazilian workers movement has done, MST. We look at that. We once sent uh, two people there to be trained by MST in Brazil. We are also looking at La Vaya, La Vaya Campesina. It's a world, uh, uh, you know, country that looks for food sovereignty and so on. So we are part of the global islands of those that are fighting for it. The global uh, slavery and slavery reparations movement uh, in Namibia, the talk has quieted down. I, I think, and that is what we have been discussing other day with our leader and chief change company, the Honorable Bernardo Swarbo, is that I think we must dedicate the last half of this year to visit some of these reparations movements in, in the UK and, and also in US and so on, so that we rekindle this global spirit. But we are well seized with it. Uh, um, in fact, our policy is that we help to create a Pan-African Center of Namibia here. That was many years ago, but that struggle has quieted down relatively in Africa. Even if you go to DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, if you go to Senegal, Ghana, uh, the, where most of this uh, transatlantic slavery has taken place, it has relatively quieted down. But I know there are some that are working behind the scenes. What we need is maybe a global African Congress so that we can look at all these struggles uh, of, of the anti-slavery movements and the transatlantic slavery, because Belgian Con Congo has lost out, actually, if you look in terms of human beings, they have lost a lot. Mineral resources, human resources, they were killed. Uh, even their leader, Patrice Lumumba, was executed. Uh -huh. so, so, so it is true what you are saying. Maybe it's to meet now that many uh, countries are independent in Africa. Uh, and so that Caribbeans can come and we pick up the struggle. Otherwise, the work of uh, Dr. W.E.B. Dubois, uh, 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 Marcus Garvey, uh, uh, Bob Marley, uh, Lucky Dube, um, uh, you know, um, Peter Tosh, most of these heroes are also in US. Uh, Malcolm X them, it will die down. And, and the generational fight that was decades ago might move backwards. And, and the memory due to these new things like 
Chad GPT and the new social media things, people might lose history. So we need really to take that struggle forward so that it is also teach in our schools as part of the new curriculum. Because what is happening with privatization of education is that they tend to leave out history most of the time. They focus on uh, new fields like actual science and uh, IT and, and, and climate change. And, and then our children tend to lose out on history. Because if you study history, it's seen as not forward looking, not progressive. You, you are not talking right things. So, so that cultural imperialism and, and, and education imperialism is what we need to debunk as, as, as part of this because public education must uh, uh, make sure that history is kept alive. So we have to build museums. Like in Namibia now, we are debating currently how we are going to set up the Genocide Memorial Museum, for example. I think Tuesday, we are going to have a conclusion about it. So we must build Genocide Memorial Museums, but we must also transform this into the film industry. Documentaries must be made. Books should be written. Uh, 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 American Hollywood stars must come so that we can see how we collaborate, so that the history isn't dead. And some in the world, like Donald Trump, them, will want to kill progressive people's history very much. And although we are a small movement, we must record these things, have documentation centers, so that our history never dies and keeps on going and getting stronger every year every day absolutely and and i agree with your point about especially the cultural imperial aspect and decolonizing the mind and emphasizing the history has to be learned as well with that i'm i'm curious about the history of german colonialism but also the history of uh south african or the apartheid colonialism when namibia was colonized uh as southwest africa what was the enforcement of the apartheid policies and, and how does it have a legacy today of, of also there being white South African settlers coming in and, and taking up land and uh, dispossessing Namibians and the legacy of the uh, Namibian War of Independence or the, the Bush War or border conflict as it's called in South Africa? Yes, uh, you will remember that South Africa, uh, Namibia was a mandated territory. So it was given to South Africa so that South Africa prepares Namibia for independence. That was now the League of Nations. It transformed to UN. In 1948, the National Party took over in South Africa. They made and annexed Namibia as their fifth province. So that's how the South African apartheid regime started to govern us uh, since 1948. But uh, nonetheless, um, the same policies that they applied, divide and rule policies, apartheid policies, they impose it also here in Namibia. The biggest being one is that they took, well, they, they like the Germans previously did, they also took part in the land disposition. So they came to chase out people from fertile areas, uh, like Hochland Park in Vendu to Katutura in, 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 in Vendu. So they displaced, and then they introduced this policy of the rural and urban Namibia, and they have chased uh, away most of the black people were forced to work at the wild people's farms as uh, land workers, farm workers, um, and they were paid mega uh, wages, pittances, and when it comes to schools, there was segregation. Uh, whites had a different school system. Blacks had an inferior system called the Bando education. So in all aspects, they legislated, and whatever they legislated, that in South Africa was having an effect here because we were treated as the fifth province of, of South Africa. So the liberation movements, the oldest one, the, the African National Congress, uh, inspired also our people, uh, those ones that were taken to study in Cape Town or when they as contract workers, they met and decided to form uh, 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 the first, the SWANU, Southwest African National uh, unity or union, and then they also formed uh, Southwest Africa People's Organization. But there were some already 
during the colonial time, 1904-1908, genocide, there were leaders here, Captain Hendre Vetboe, if you look at the Namibian uh, note, uh, people like Samuel Maharero. So our forebears were already fighting the Germans. And from Germans, it continued with the apartheid South African regime. And uh, Dr. Hendrik Ferbur, Dr. Uh, Malan, uh, 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 Herzog, uh, uh, you know, Evier de Klerk, et cetera. So it has been a generational struggle. So South African laws were effectively used here for divide and rule purposes. Uh, so hence, we also fought in this country. So I think that that is basically the long and short. Hence now the challenges are same today when it comes to land reform. The challenges are same when it comes to poverty, eradication, uh, uh, you know, inequality, uh, uh, eradication, and so on. So um, that's why also as landless people, we have got also same organizations in South Africa that we are working with. They also have a landless people's movement over there. And there are progressive movements like the Pan-Africanist Congress, for example, very progressive, black first, land first. So the similar challenges are being waged there. And, and we collaborate uh, now because we were formed in 2019, the projects we collaborate on smaller scale now, but we predict it will grow in size in the next five years. Uh, one of our aim is also to have uh, international solidarity conference in Namibia, uh, so that we can have, as I said, the Brazilian, uh, you know, MST, Brazilian Workers Movement. We can get them over. La Via Campesina, they can come over. It's based in Zambia, but it has membership all over the world. They influence on food sovereignty at the United Nations level. Um, so we are hoping to strengthen ourselves and to work with everyone that has a social democratic agenda that seeks to call for a social justice in this world. Social justice is, is key. We are saying we want equality. Uh, we want equity. Uh, we, we, we want everybody at least to have a daily meal. We want people not to live on streets, sleep under bridges and so on. Uh, this capitalist system is, is so evil to all of us. And we are fighting for one aim, so that humanity can exist peacefully, peaceful coexistence. That is what we want, ultimately. We don't want guns. We don't want wars. It's not beneficial to anyone. But what we are aspiring for is a non-racial society, uh, no discrimination on the basis of, of color or sex and so on. So that is what we are actually fighting for. Uh, and, 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 and that is where we hope we shall have that international solidarity meeting one day here and, 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 and cement our relations and agendas. Yeah, your point on international solidarity is incredible to hear and making these connections across the global South between the MSD and Brazil the same exact struggle, uh, so many struggles in Latin America being directed around the lack of land, uh, the lack of homes as well. Do you believe that there is a way to conduct this struggle across these countries and also to point out and say that the challenge facing, particularly for, as, as you were mentioning before, for indigenous people across Latin America who were dispossessed by colonialism is still a struggle around land uh, it's still a struggle for national self-determination. And how do you think that the landless people's movement of Namibia can offer its own lessons to struggles across Africa, across Latin America, uh, across Asia for uh, land redistribution and for sovereignty? Yeah, we, we can have a, what I call uh, internationalize our struggles. Um, uh, that's why we, our international relations office will take an aggressive look because we are small at this stage but we really want to collaborate with others international solidarity is always very important because you can't uh, fight in isolation uh, our struggle is a struggle for humanity it's for the whole world 
So what the indigenous communities in Brazil or, 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 or Colombia or Bolivia, Chile, and in India, the caste system are facing, their pain is also our pain. And their struggles are also our struggles. And our struggles are their struggles also. Uh, you saw how um, uh, you see in uh, uh, Myanmar, what they did with the Rohingya. Uh, 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 even, uh, and that's why I've written off Aung San Suu Kyi. We were fighting for her, only for her to commit a genocide against the Rohingya people. So these are the people and these are the struggles that we must hold hands and fight uh, globally. And that's why I say, although we are new, we must take up this space so that we have access to the world power institutions like uh, the United Nations, the Secretary General's office, and, and so on, because these things can happen just like this in any other part of the world. And Namibia is no exception. We have got indigenous communities here, like the Sun, the Hainkum, the Damara, <clears throat> that have lost land, colonial land disposition. Now the black on black oppression is very strong in areas like Namibia. And these are the things that we must fight for. My last question is just if you can speak a little bit to the the real conditions to get a sense, you, and you have a little bit throughout, for someone who's watching in the United States or throughout the world who may not understand what it is like to be landless in Namibia for the people who have been dispossessed of their land, what are the conditions they face, the social conditions, hunger, famine, economic conditions, and how can someone who is in the Imperial Corps in the Global North have solidarity for, for that person and struggle mm -hmm. for them? Um, the, uh, the, the landlessness is, is a real struggle here, especially access to urban land. Uh, the, the most of the areas, they sell land on a very high price, uh, but where we govern, we normally give permission to occupy. So if you see a, a vacant land, we go and uh, measure it off. Then we give you a permission to occupy certificate. And once the bulk municipal services are brought there, water and electricity, sanitation, and etc. Once it is brought, then now the people can enter and, and build their houses and so on. But it is, um, we have many, informal settlements in Namibia. I think maybe 61, from 45 to 61% of our population lives in corrugated iron sheets and in the informal settlements. So access to urban land and, and, and because of the colonial spatial development policies, uh, it was unfortunate most of the people uh, have been living in the urban periphery and so on. The colonial administration did not build infrastructure for them. And now, once the independence came, uh, because of the pull and pull factors, you know, the drought conditions, soil erosion, uh, desertification, and so on, most of the people move from the, uh, you know, the migration to place from rural areas to the urban centers. And once these people come into urban areas like Ventuk, Swakopmon, Wolfis Bay, or Chivarango, uh, they tend to reside in the urban periphery where services are not there or provided for. So it is putting a strain on the municipal managers now to provide answers to these people. So it takes time. So uh, I think at one stage, the president said maybe five, six years ago that he has to declare a humanitarian crisis for inf informal settlements. It's a real, real, real issue. Not only here, but in South Africa, it's the same in Kenya. Kibera Township, I think it's the biggest informal settlement in Africa, in Kenya. So these are the real challenges. And now with that comes access to potable water and so on. And, and sometimes you will see cholera breakouts or uh, hepatitis breakouts and, and, and so on now and then because of uh, unhygienic conditions and access of, of water is, is, is not there and so on. So and it puts a strain on our health challenges, our health infrastructure. Uh, so, so we need to have a good answer 
that address uh, rural poverty through integrated rural development strategies uh, and 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 agrarianization of 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 the rural areas uh, we need to talk to agriculture so that we can retain some of the people create jobs there make the rural lives very interesting so that people don't flock to the urban centers where these amenities are not readily available. So that is a big challenge in the rural ele electrification is also a challenge in, 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 in Namibia. Um, most of our rural areas don't have access to readily available electricity. And when you do small business and so on, it becomes a challenge. Transportation is a problem still. So there are a lot of those basic things that we must get right so that we make Namibians happy wherever they are, so that they can grow and prosper in life wherever they are. But in terms we are providing currently the, the orphans and vulnerable children's grants, the disability grant, uh, the senior people, the elders from the age of 60, government, we give them 3,000 Namibian dollars uh, we, we, in terms of our safety nets, we are okay. What we are now fighting for is the basic income grant as a movement. At least through basic income grant, if everybody gets something so that they are able to buy basic food commodities, it will be good. So the basic income grant is what we are fighting for. We are also fighting to increase the universal health coverage. For example, uh, if you have a good job, you afford private medical uh, health care. But we are saying, let's open up, and let's have a universal health care so that people can also, ordinary people, can also access private medical care, medicine, and so on. So we are trying to fight and bring in all these welfare policies that will advance all of us. Now we have a high unemployment rate, especially amongst youth. Uh, so we are saying, okay, why don't we think of a policy, maybe unemployed unemployment grant or something? Why don't we soften and give small and medium enterprises some subsidies through the Development Bank of Namibia and, and through the Agricultural Bank of Namibia? Uh, those ones who want to start horticulture, animal husbandry, and other business. So these are the type of things that we are looking at as a movement. And this is what we intend to provide. Thank you so much, comrade, for doing yeah. this. Take care mm -hmm. and have a good rest Thank of your day. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll speak again. Thanks. Yes. All right. Thanks. Bye. The window of hope. Oh, yeah. The window of hope. The window of hope. Oh, yeah. The window of hope.